Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Wilshire. I'm a board certified physician, surgeon, and reproductive endocrinologist. Welcome to my series of podcasts where we discuss medical matters that matter to you. I'll be interviewing top experts in their fields, and we'll also be delving into fascinating backstories from deep within the world of medicine. Welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. Our guest today is Dr. Joss Fernandez. Welcome to the show, Joss. Hi, Dr. Gill. How are you? I'm doing great. What a, what a privilege is, it is to have you here. Joss Fernandez is uh, a medical doctor. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, he has so many credentials and, and such lengthy training, it's hard to pigeonhole you. Uh, but I will just call you in general. You're a cardiothoracic surgeon. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, my main practice is cardiothoracic surgery, but I also practice vascular surgery in Gosh. addition. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. You've got so many, uh, so many talents and so many, so many uh, skill sets. So help me understand what a cardiothoracic surgeon actually does, Joss. Everybody's heard of open heart surgery. What, well, what is open heart surgery? So cardiac. It, it, it's called cardiothoracic surgery because not only vascular peeled away from it a while back, now you're starting to see the thoracic part peel away. Is that and, kind of like it, the lung stuff? Yeah, that means chest lung and stuff? esophagus. And esophagus so swallowing is thoracic. Too. Right. So, okay. So cardiac means you're dealing with the heart. Uh, the most common operation is when we do bypass, you know, people talk about triple quadruple bypass called a cabbage a coronary artery bypass graft right cabbage so, yeah so you would take uh in general you take a piece of vein from the leg or also I mean, it, it's usually a combination of different tubes that we're taking vein from the leg an artery from but back behind a breastbone or an artery from the arm all those ah. are common so you, so you can take out an artery from the arm and use that as a graft as well Yes. Gotcha. So you're essentially reperfusing, or I want to use terms everyone understands. You're bringing good blood supply to a heart that has poor supply, blockages in various places, and you can get around these these blockages. Is that what you're doing? Exactly. So the, the arteries that feed the actual heart muscle are called coronaries, and okay. those coronaries, when you have a blockage in them, they prevent the heart muscle to get oxygen and, and perfusion. So when someone says they're having a coronary, what they mean they're having a coronary artery blockage. Exactly. And yeah. it's called a coronary. Okay. Yeah. And so what we're doing is rerouting. We're just taking that tube where we, wherever we got it. We got it from the leg. If it's a vein, you have extra vein artery in your wrist. And then sewing one end to the main pipe of the body, which is the aorta. Okay. And then the other end to the blocked artery beyond the blockage beyond you know, it just beyond it and then that'll get that will take blood from the aorta down into the the heart muscle and we we'll leave the and the heart's a lot happier that way right exactly. so how do you determine whether you want to whether an intervention a cardiologist when cardiologist will thread little tubes up through the groin or whatnot and go and open these blockages with balloons i believe that's called an angioplasty when would you do an angioplasty versus a full bypass that you would do? Yeah, so that's a source of confusion. There's two specialists. Uh, one is a surgeon like myself, and then the other one is a medicine doctor, which is a cardiologist, and their, their training is completely separate. Mm -hmm. So the cardiologists are able to string wires up into the coronary itself and put in stents, which are little metal cages that Pop open the artery by they pop open and open up these partial blockages. Yeah, and how about when they put balloons in there? Is that called angioplasty? That's called angioplasty. Usually they're bo both done at the same time. So you're using okay. a balloon to stretch out the stent, or you're ballooning before you place the stent, or the stent's mounted on a balloon. So would you be when it's when it's too? So when would they? Would you be? Called in to do something when it's so bad that you can't do it. It's it's a bigger blockage. Yeah, everybody wants 
um, catheterization and stent. That's because it's simple, easy. It's an overnight stay. It's a puncture wound in the wrist or the groin, either way. Um, but if there's so many blockages in a lot of places, and if the blockages are especially at the most important artery in the front of the artery called the left anterior descending artery, the LAD. Okay. Um, which feeds a lot of the pumping chamber. That's the big feeder. The big feeder. Okay. Or something called left main, which is the widow maker. That's mm -hmm. the artery that not only feeds the LAD, the artery in the front, it also feeds the circumflex, which is the artery on the side. Okay. Um, or if you're diabetic and the diabetics sometimes don't take the stents very well, they, they uh, re re block them. Okay. So basically uh, if we're, if you come in and you have blockages, multiple blockages, you're likely you're healthy enough to live five years. So we wouldn't consider it necessarily in a 95 year old, but uh, you're going to live five years and or more or more. And, and your blockages are bad enough in multiple areas that you would require multiple stents. If it's a left main widow maker or proximal or close to the front of the, the artery, the LAD, okay. um, or if you've already suffered heart attacks where your heart's weakened, then we uh -huh. prefer bypass. Okay. The reason is bypass is a huge risk up front. It's open heart surgery. Gotcha. But oh, now let's say what open heart surgery is. They make an incision in the skin. You take a saw and you go through the breastbone. You cut the breastbone in half and you, you pry it open. You've got these retractors that hold it open and expose the heart and the whole center of the chest. Yes. Yeah. So that's, I can see it because that's a big upfront surgery to get there. Yes. But then you can do more repair once you're there. You get more blood supply to more parts. Of it. You can do a quadruple that get parts to all you can do five bypasses if you had to but you'd get blood supply all parts of the heart and it's more durable uh, less likely that you would need further down the road and the real catch is it's more likely to preserve the strength of the heart long term versus if you do a stent then down the road you need another stent down the road you need another stent the squeeze of the heart can weaken over time versus a bypass. That's the advantage, but it, the huge disadvantage that everyone recognizes, it's, it's a big operation. It's a massive sure. operation. Sure, sure. Gotcha. Yeah. So you pay me now or pay me later. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's it. Now, how much of your day-to-day -day work is, is open heart? 25%, 50% of your work, of your workload? About 50%. About yeah. 50. So you're spending a lot of time doing yeah. those. And the rest is uh, vascular, which is the same. It, it's the same concept, but it's blockages in other areas of the body, like neck arteries. So the do same. Do you do surgery on neck arteries? Yeah. Carotid. You do that too? Yeah. Those are those called the end arterectomies? Yes. Ah, I didn't know you did those as well. Boy, you're busy. Yeah. Being double, double trained. Oh, my goodness. So, um, when you do an open heart, is that that also allows you access to the inside of the heart and the workings of the heart, right? The valves, yeah. The valves, yeah. So that's, it. of all the things to go wrong, the valves frequently have problems too, don't they? Right, yeah. So sometimes we have to address the valves. Those are diagnosed with echocardiography, which is an ultrasound using the jelly on the surface of the chest to look at the heart. So you yeah. you say, hey, you, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you have a, I think the mitral valve is one of the more common valves that go bad. Uh, I saw a woman today with what's called mitral valve regurgitation, where the valve goes bad. So if a valve is starting to fail, I mean, a valve that opens allows blood to go one way, the heart contracts, that valve closes, and so this is this way the heart is pushing the blood in one direction. Now, and if that valve fails or leaks, obviously you don't get an efficient pump. So um, I know mitral valves are a very common problem. What can you do for the mitral valve? Yeah, so there's valves or passive flappers. They're supposed to get pushed open by the heart when it's pumping and shut to keep the blood going in the same direction. Uh, they can either leak. That means they don't shut all the way. So it's kind of like a turkey baster. You pump one, but you get some of it back. Ah, 
yes. that's not good. And then the other way they can fail is they're too hardened. The flappers, it takes a lot of force to get them open. So they're tight. They're tight. Gotcha. That's called stenosis. Okay. You know? So the regurgitation is a leaky valve. It just doesn't shut all the way. And there's different reasons for that. In the mitral position, they tend to leak because they are um, become, with certain disease processes, a little bit baggy. And the cords, the little uh, parachute cords that hold it in place, one of them can tear. And so the flapper actually flips off. That's uh. called prolapse. And that'll let blood go back into the lungs in the mitral you're keeping blood going from the lungs to the heart and if it's going backwards you'll become short of breath i see so when do you how bad does it have to be to can you replace a mitral valve you can replace so that uh we rate it mild moderate severe and there's okay. different criteria for that and also your symptoms dictate a lot uh, the mitral is uh, fortunately we can repair a lot of those ah. Uh, so that means, let's say there's a little tip of it that's flipped up. We can take a stitch and tack it back down. Huh. And or if the valve, the the um, area around the valve has been stretched apart, so the fl the flappers quite don't quite meet. Uh -huh. We can take a ring and cinch it down so those flappers meet more uh, closely. Bring them back together, strengthen. Uh, Is yeah. that that's called an annulus? Yes, and an annuloplasty is when we cinch it down so you can repair a mitral valve so you don't have to repair, repair that all yeah our goal is to repair like uh, 90 percent of mitral valves we're you know mostly realistically it depends on the population gotcha. um there's uh certain diseases like rheumatic fever or you know you have strep throat when you're a kid and uh -huh. well 40 years later your valve is destroyed by antibodies and has become wow, thick that long 40 years oh, after yeah. a childhood infection yeah you can still have symptoms so you, we're sequelae we call them side effects yeah side effects so yeah you want to that's why you don't want strep throat for a long time that's unaddressed with antibiotics oh. uh, so that's rheumatic fever if you've had so in the age of antibiotics we don't see it as much but if you're in an area where there's a lot of uh, rheumatic fever and your valves bad those are really hard to repair so your percentage of repair will be lower than if you're just using doing um, degenerative valves or valves that are baggy and, and tear. So in order to get in and do a, a valve repair, you have to open the chest, this open heart. And I assume you need to stop the heart so you can work on it. So what keeps the blood pumping in the body? Yeah, what keeps it, them alive? Um, the heart-lung machine is an amazing invention that made cardiac surgery even possible. And it does what just what it says, heart and lung. So the heart does two things. One, it, it pumps, right? So it's a pump. It's a centrifugal, magnetically elevated pump that just uh, turns the blood. Um, and, and there are problems with that because you're destroying blood if you're mechanically compressing it and so the longer you're on the machine the more it, it chews up the blood chews up the blood yeah gotcha so you don't want to be on it too long uh, then the other thing that is intimately associated with the heart is the lungs so we're not able to isolate just the heart and work on the heart by itself we have to isolate the heart and lungs you have to keep oxygen coming into so you have to pump the blood and keep the, it oxygenated Yes. So the, um, the machine has a, a artificial lung that where the blood gets pushed through it and they literally pipe oxygen through these fibers that oh my goodness. are transferred. So you see on one end of the tube, it's black, dark blood deoxygenating. On the other end, it's bright red blood. It's like bright red. Yeah. Wow. So that's a whole world unto itself. The heart lung machine, there's perfusionists, there's people that spend their lives specialists, yeah. specializing just keeping that heart lung machine going. Now, on the other side of the heart, where it's uh, the part of the heart that pumps blood through the lungs doesn't have to pump as hard, but the side of the heart that pumps to the body, that's the strong high pressure side, right? Yes. So there's two, are there two valves on that side that can go bad? Yes, there's two valves. The the left side pumps to the body and takes it from the, the lungs and pumps to the right. The right side 
pumps to the lungs. To the That's lungs. all it does, which is a lot low, lower pressure system. So where are the valves on the right side under the high pressure side? The, well, the right side I mean, is I mean the, the left side. I got yeah. them confused. Okay. Yeah, the left side is the high pressure side is the mitral and the aortic valve. What's the aortic valve? Yeah. So the aortic. Now, what can you do for the aortic valve? I mean, I know those can can be replaced. Yeah. So it's the opposite for the aortic valve. So we're trying to repair most mitral valves. Okay. In the aortic side, most of all of them are replaced. It's really hard uh, to repair the aortic. There are some techniques to repair it, but for the most part, if you need an aortic valve done, it's going to be replaced. Replaced. Now, in the old days of the open heart surgery, you'd have your your choice. I guess you still have your choice of various valves. Are there artificial valves? And I know there's a maybe a pig valve. Can you tell us the difference between them, please? Yeah, there's two categories of valves. The metal valve is also called mechanical. The metal mechanical valves are nice because they last a long time, 20, 30 years. Uh, in fact, I took out a um, one of the ball, uh, they used to be ball cage valves. Yeah, I've seen and, it. It's and, a cage with a ball. The ball literally yeah. floats around in the cage. Yeah, up and down. it looks like uh, something you would see on like your dishwasher or something. Yeah, or your toilet. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, the uh, So I took one out that was 44 years old. Oh, my goodness. We was it all crusty and stuff? Or it looked, still looked it pretty looked good. Amazing. It wow. looked amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but that was yeah, – we published that. Um, uh, so the mechanicals are long-lasting. The two disadvantages, major disadvantage, you have to be on blood thinner. And forever. Forever. Uh. Forever. Forever. And there have been some advances. There's a new valve that doesn't require as much blood thinner, but you still have to be on blood thinner. And there's been two trials looking at the new types of blood thinners where you don't have to check your blood level. Yeah, the pills you see on TV. Yeah, those yeah. both failed. So, uh. so you have to be on the old rat poison. The warfarin. Warfarin, Coumadin. Coumadin, or yes. Coumadin, as it's War called. But, yeah. The, there, yeah. Are, there are Coumadin clinics, in fact, where they just check people's uh, how long that their clotting has been lengthened. Yes. We call it thinning, but we're actually lengthening or lowering the clotting potential of the blood. Yeah. So you have artificial valves. You know, what, tell me about what are these pig valves they've had for years? So the, the other category is tissue valve. And a tissue valve is, uh, for the most part right now, is just pig or cow. Or cow. Or cow. We have both. Um, and uh, those are nice. Well, let me back up. One other bad thing about mechanical valves is uh -huh. they, they make a noise. They do. They click. They click. All the, forever. Forever. Well, so the patient stops hearing it. Their brain shuts it off, but their partner uh, hears it forever. So <laughs> you have to sleep next to a person who clicks. Yeah. It's like an old clock on the wall where it's just like that second hand. It's just like. Picking, yeah, and a partner hears it forever. But some but the reason, person, but the, the person with it stops hearing it first. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. Their brain wow. just shuts it off. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like after a couple of years, you're like, do you hear it? It's like I don't hear anything, and the wife is like, oh yeah, uh, I, I hear it. I gotta sleep on the couch. <laughs> I got a separate bedroom now. Yeah. I'm just waiting for it to stop clicking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you're in trouble if it stops. But so you can make this valve. Now the aortic valve, let me say this again, is the valve that shuts off out of the heart into the aorta. So this is under high pressure. This, this super is high pressure. Yeah. This is super high pressure. This is what keeps your blood pressure going. Right. That shuts the blood off at the aorta going up. Yeah, there. that's the highest pressure in the body. So the tissue valves don't click. They're pliable. They're made out of cow or pig. Um, and uh, they don't require blood thinner. They just an aspirin, uh, baby aspirin is enough. So the the downside is durability. They don't. They're not as durable. So they're probably twelve to fifteen years. If we're being honest, now it, it, you know if you're looking at the data, and we're like, well, who actually had to get a new valve or something like that? You might be able to extend that over fifteen years, but twelve to fifteen years is about right. Gotcha. The, the downside is the younger you are, the less durable, less long-lasting the tissues. For some reason, younger people chew up valves faster. They calcify them. Huh. So the older you are, they last longer. It's the opposite of what you want. 
settlement. I see. I see. And to do a total valve replacement requires this open heart surgery. Now, a couple, maybe a few years ago, they built a whole new wing on the operating in the operating suite here at the hospital uh, for you and your partner Richard Millet. And I believe it was designed for you to do this fancy new procedure where you can get around the open heart surgery to replace the aortic valve. Would you tell us about this amazing technology that you uh, now perform? Yeah, so that's, uh, it's revolutionized uh, aortic valve surgery by far and away. And it's called TAVR, T-A-V-R, Trans Aortic Valve Replacement. And wow. so what that is, is the valve is crimped. It's mounted on a stent, like just like the stent we talked about for the corners, but much bigger. It's a way, it's the size of your pinky finger. And it's crimped down. And what we do is we place the valve over a wire that's been placed inside the heart. All right. So you thread, does this go up through the groin? Through the groin. Through the groin. So you thread up. And I got to tell you folks what this suite looks like. It's got all these x-rays and TVs and yeah. technicians and rooms and wires. And it's, it's just, it's a whole elaborate instruction here for this, primarily for this one procedure. So through yeah. the groin, you will thread a wire up into the heart. Now, how do you get the wire? I guess you have to go up the aorta and then down up the aorta the valve. and across the valve with a wire. You just poke around until you get through the valve. Okay. Between the flappers. You're not, you're not going through the flappers, but. Okay. The flat, where the hole is and then you have a wire we use a rigid wire now is this per person not on a heart lung machine no you're they can be awake way. yeah they can even be awake so their yeah. heart is beating while you're doing yes. this yes that's a huge mm -hmm. advantage yeah. amazing so the patient is maybe sedated a little bit sedated yeah. okay so you thread a wire up through the groin up the aorta this major artery over there's an arch mm -hmm. and then you get the wire to come down then you get through the valve through the valve then what do you do then we, in general, all we have to do is go up with the valve that's mounted on a stent. Um, and there's Collapse. So it's collapsed. skinny. It's collapsed. It's contracted. It's a it's small contracted. diameter. Very small. And you thread that bad boy up and into the aorta. Uh -huh. And then you release it. There's two ways to release. There's two valves. One is you release with a balloon. A balloon blows up and stretches the heart, the, the valve. So you've got the old valve. It might be tight, might be damaged, might be calcified or something. Yeah. And you literally expand it or crush it, it. You crush it open. Out of the way, yeah. Out of the way. So now that's out of the way. So now you've got an open tube. Yes. And then what do you do? Well, there's the stent. And inside that stent is sewn on a cow valve. A brand, okay, brand, brand new to you, yeah. cow valve. Right. And that'll pack down and then open up. It'll open up as soon as you Amazing. open it. Yeah. Now, there is one, the, the other type of stent, uh, you don't use a balloon. You just extrude it out of the cap. It's trying to open up by itself because of the warm blood, and you just pull the catheter, and it extrudes out. So you don't have to use a balloon. It opens itself. So it makes a tight fit, yeah. and now you've got a brand-new valve right, right there. So when we're blowing a balloon up, we do have to – drop the blood pressure in the patient. And the way we do that is by using electrical conduction with a pacemaker and make the heart be 180 times a minute, which is very inefficient. It doesn't have time to fill. Uh, and so at that point, the blood pressure just drops. Uh, so it induces a low blood pressure by we're making it beat so fast that it can't fill. And that gives us that because you, Last thing you want to do is blow up a balloon and against the beating heart. It's first of all, the heart doesn't like that. It's a muscle squeezing against mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, you know, completely locked out muscle trying to squeeze. So that's bad for the muscle. And plus, you uh, you can move the the balloon might move out of the way while you're mm -hmm. trying to point, and it ends up somewhere else where you don't want it. It so has to be properly positioned. It has to be, yeah. That's why all those act those real time. X-rays, X-rays that yeah. you're taking and watching it in real time. Yeah, to it's called fluorescent. For what's fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that whole room is designed to do all that uh, to the tune of 1.8 million. That's expensive stuff, yeah. and, you, and you're wearing lead too. And lead protection. Everybody's wearing lead, so it's a huge production to be able to do this. So you can get through a tiny hole in the body. You can get a 
a brand new valve in the aorta. Yes, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. What it would be, obviously it depends on how sick your patients are. What kind of mortality are you looking at? Do 10% of your patients die? 1% of your patients die? I, I assume somebody's going to die. They, so the, for depending on a procedure, so a TAVR. A, a, TAVR, so you're doing your, a run-of-the-mill everyday TAVR that you do. So our 30-day mortality is less than 0.5%. It's 0.5? Yeah. That's amazing. So one out of two hundred, yeah. and you're treating a condition that that will that's essentially lethal. That's going to end their oh, life. Yeah. Not likely soon. to live two years once you have symptoms. Wow. From- so that's a, I, I would trade that. So I'm going to die within five years, or I'm going to die one in two hundred. Right. That's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do it. Yeah. You know. And plus, it's a miserable death. If when you have a tight or the the flappers doesn't open an aortic valve, you don't just drop well you can drop dead but yeah. a lot of times you just go in heart failure and miserable oh. and can't breathe and and fatigued and it's it's not a like uh okay i'm just gonna drop dead and right right and live a great life up to that moment it's it won't it's Slow. not like that yeah. you know I, I remember when i was a medical student uh, learning about heart failure learning the numbers with heart failure it's worse than a lot of cancers for sure yeah for sure yeah yeah so that's amazing so how many of these tavers have you done now joss uh well we're probably uh, like 400 we do about wow. 80 to 100 a year we've been doing it wow. well for five years so yeah and Ted, does your but, partner do them as well yeah he does them as well you and so Richard we, do we split them up we don't it just depends on what day who's on that day yet. gotcha gotcha well that's amazing now when it sometimes the aorta this va- this this vessel that's under all this pressure will sometimes dilate and get big from all this pressure I believe that's called an aneurysm. Yes. Do you do surgery for those? Yes. So that's another issue is when the aorta itself, so uh, it gets bigger, bigger than it's supposed to be. And it, depending on where you are, it could just rupture. Uh, in the bed, it could explode. Yeah. So that, yeah. And, uh, and that you'll bleed out internally. Or another process is called dissection. So the aorta is a pipe the wall of the pipe has layers okay and sometimes instead of just busting open and rupturing the inner lining tears and blood gets in between linings uh, that's called um, the dissection dissection so that's uh, a little that's also extremely dangerous uh, rupture is immediately dangerous because it's it, it can be fatal right away and most people die with a rupture it d- depends on the aneurysm so it, Aneurysms in your chest tend to dissect, and then aneurysms in your belly tend to rupture, not rupture. Di- yeah, because of the make it, the aorta is not one pipe made out of the same material the whole way. It kind of changes uh, how much it lasts and that type of thing. But the dissection um, is uh, is a bad way to die, you know. So now, with the Regular, regular. If there's anything regular about a surgeon, but would a regular vascular surgeon do more of the the ones in the lower aorta and the abdomen? Yes. So, and you would do the mainly the the aneurysms or dissections in the chest. In the chest, right? Gotcha. So that's the division between cardiac and vascular. The vascular surgeon would do it below the diaphragm or in the belly, and then the okay. va- cardiac surgeon will do it in the chest. Yeah. This could be an emergency in the middle of the night, can't they? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yeah. can be. Yeah, they can be bad, and they, and they happen more frequently. Uh, you know, you talk about aortic dissection, and it was like, oh, I've never heard of that. Most people would say they've never heard, of it. but um, people die all the time. John Ritter, Three's Company, uh, died of an aortic dissection, and his wife uh, was a huge advocate for. Getting CAT scans, uh, his to di- screen for them to screen. Yeah, well, he was uh, diagnosed late. They he came into the emergency room and with chest pain, and he thought he was having a heart attack. They never got a CAT scan, and they shot his coronaries. They're like, oh wait a minute, this guy has a dissection, and and wow. it was too late. It was too late. Yeah, so she went around the country, you know, advocating getting CAT scans for people with chest chest pain but, but it becomes a problem is like, do you get cat scan on every person that gets a chest pain it's not right. so clear cut but gotcha. uh, they uh, 
and abdominal aortic aneurysms are, you know, very common too. The, you, uh, Albert Einstein died of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Really? Yeah. He's, but that was early on before the Bakey came up with a way to replace it with a polyester tubing. Back then, they would wrap the aorta in cellophane trying to contain the rupture. Oh my goodness. Because the only all their alternative was just to tie it off, which is great. It stops the bleeding, but then you have no blood supply to your legs. Your legs. Oh, my goodness. Um, and most people didn't survive that. Um, some people did, but most did not. So they would wrap it in cellophane, and they did his, and then he leaked the the cellophane didn't hold, and they asked him if he wanted another operation, and he said it would be vain to ask to live longer than he has already lived. Oh my and goodness! What an amazing Einstein story! I'd never heard that. Yeah. Wow, I've got stories as a medical student. I know. And we're going to talk about this with Johnny Adams, so your va our vascular sure, yeah. fellow, uh, later on uh, this week. But in the old days, they'd open the belly. I, mean, I was a medical student for some of these. And they would clamp the aorta, this big clamp. And yeah. they clamp it, and I'm holding the clamp. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And then they cut out the aorta part, and they right. put in that, that, that mesh graft or that tube down there. I have never seen so much blood in my life. Oh my God, the belly just fills up and I'm holding this thing and the surgeon is sweating and it's cursing. And, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, I'll never forget it. Yeah. And and so in the chest, it's usually not ruptured because if it pops, ruptures, you're dead. You're, dead. you're not, you're not going to make it to them. So usually it's dissected when we see you. Now, there are people that, do survive a rupture in the chest. Those are like car accidents. Sometimes you see that um, so that the aorta tears just partially, just enough to leak, and you're able to get a stent in there, a covered stent. You don't necessarily have to operate on them. Uh, when it's the, the the part of the aorta that's going down the chest. So like look, put an inner tube in there. It, put it in, it, right. Essentially an inner tube. Yeah, like yeah exactly. Just, just salvage it from the inside. Uh, so that's a common way to die from um, a, a car accident. A blunt force trauma. Sudden deceleration. So you're traveling along 50 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden you stop. On the steering wheel. On the steering wheel. <laughs> right. Well, not uh, uh, your heart keeps going because the heart's just hanging in there. Yeah. So that shears. Yeah. So that, it shears, right. And, right. Uh, and part of the aorta. And the aorta, the term aorta means hanger. Like so, something's hanging, so it's the hanger of the heart. Ah. Yeah, the, it's hanging the heart, holding the heart. So you can lift the heart up, but the aorta, just the first parts lifting up. The rest is attached to the spine and those uh, those tissues. So uh, so that'll stop when your chest hits, but the rest keeps going, and you get a tear. So that that's uh, aortic tear. If it's not bad enough, uh, you can get salvaged. If you're Princess Diana, uh, you're not. And then so she had a tear between the attachment of the aorta and the pulmonary artery. There's a fetal attachment there that tore, and that's that's what cost her her life from that sudden deceleration injury from a car accident. Yeah. Oh, I've heard about Einstein and Princess Di here. Yeah. Wow, this is this is fascinating stuff. Yeah. So now, so also in the chest is the esophagus where you swallow food. If it goes to your stomach, well, it's got to go through the chest, in right. fact. Right, yeah. So do you ever have to work on the esophagus? I, I do very little esophageal work, but cardiothoracic, the thoracic part, they do. Oh. So esophagectomies is part of our training where we remove, ectomy meaning removal okay. of the esophagus, when mostly for cancer. For cancer. Yeah. And those are cancers that happen when... In the United States, it's mostly because of acid from your stomach going up into esophagus. It's burning it for years. Yes. And then those cells transform and become cancerous cells. Is that the Barrett? Exactly. That's Barrett's the Barrett. esophagus. So you can actually work on that. Now, also in the chest, and maybe since you're the vascular, you don't do much, but I assume that you know how to operate on the on the lungs. Yeah, so I do do a lot of lung surgery. Uh, so lung surgery is removal, for the most part, 
lung surgery is removal for tumor. So if you have lung cancer and it's caught early enough, so stages one, two, we can remove that tumor uh, by removing part of the lung. Just that lobe. The lungs the lung. have several lobes each, right? So you can take right. a lobe out yes, and hopefully get the cancer with it, huh? Yeah. And then it can be follow up with chemotherapy or something like that. But once that cancer is spread to the lymph nodes that are in the middle of the chest or elsewhere, so stage three, four, it, um, the benefits of removing the original cancer isn't that great. So it's not worth it necessarily. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get someone that has a tumor that has spread to the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest. They get radiation, chemotherapy. And uh, they can have a lobe removed uh, because the chemotherapy radiation works so great. Uh, they're getting so better at that. They're getting better at that. So that that's a interesting. Have you ever seen um, uh, Breaking Bad? Huh. Uh, so in Breaking Bad, Walter White has lung cancer that's inoperable, but he gets chemo radiation therapy, and he's gets better enough that he can have the lobe removed but there's some confusion because he looks at his scan and it looks terrible but it's radiation not the uh, tumor and so he actually ultimately gets uh his lung resected and does well from that so that's why he lives so long during that uh, uh episode they, they bought him so you know a lung metastatic lung cancer is to your 15 percent survival uh -huh. um, so He's uh, he bought time. They kept him alive for more series, so I guess. And we also have another. Uh, it's a plug for another one of our episodes. We're going to be interviewing uh, one of our oncologists here on staff, talking about the amazing advances going on in uh, treatment of uh, of cancers and the, the biologicals. And now that they're understanding the uh, the mechanisms and the pathways and the receptors and the genetics that. Uh, Hopefully they'll work hand in hand with you to make lung cancer less uh, less mortal. Absolutely, the immune therapy, immunotherapy instead of chemotherapy, immunotherapy where you use your own immune system to fight has changed all the rules. It's all the rules. Uh, it's amazing, amazing. Yeah. We're going to be talking to Doctor Uma Ramadas about that in the yeah. coming weeks. I'm really looking forward to that. Very exciting. Um, now you also, I believe, put pacemakers in the heart. We do uh, cardiology mostly does the pacemakers. You don't do we don't, as many pacemakers as they do. Uh, so what, no, not as many as they do. There's a electrophysiology is a specialty within cardiology that does just uh, pacemakers. So those guys put most of what can happen is they can't get the pacemakers through the vein. So pacemakers are a pocket under the skin. It's a computer. Okay. Very much so. Um, with wires connecting to the heart. And the way they get to the heart is through the vein of the arm going down into the heart. And uh, those wires are really a problem. They can get infected. They can break. Um, they have trouble getting the wires in. So every once in a while, they'll call us to sew in a wire to the outside of the heart. So we'll make a small hole in your chest and okay. take some stitches and sew it right onto the heart. Okay. Uh, Whereas normally those wires go on the inside, inside of the heart. Inside the vein. They'll yeah. thread up through and they'll go into the heart. You know, they've got a little little cork Screws, screw there yeah. and yeah. attach yeah. it to the inside of the heart. But you can attach it to the outside too, huh? Yeah. So they'll call us to attach it to the outside. That's pretty much, uh, I mean, there's probably a few cardiac surgeons in the world that do pacemakers still in other countries, but not here in the U.S. Now, all of that may be going away because uh, the new, and that'd be an interesting episode for you is the pacemakers that don't have wires they're just little computers that you put into the heart directly leadless no no lead those are that's revolutionizing so it's going to go like in the heart muscle they insert it in the heart in the heart muscle. and it's got its own little computer and it yeah. controls the the beating yes patterns yes and you can put oh. one in one side of the heart one part of the heart the other one another part of the heart and it will communicate by bluetooth to each other. <laughs> Oh, uh, it, it's crazy. It's You've crazy. heard of blue snarfing when they take, you know, you go by somebody and they take your uh, address book, right? And they could, they could snarf you and actually they change your. They take your address book. Take oh, your, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They, they won't they, they, find they, anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a life. I'm a, I'm a cardiac surgeon. <laughs> yeah, I'm not worried. <laughs> well, that's amazing. 
Amazing stuff. So are there any other procedures or surgeries you do in the chest um, that, that our audience would want to know about that I haven't covered? Have we, uh, have we, we've did cabbages, we've done valves, we've done lung cancer. Yeah, uh, no, those are like the, the bulk of the surgeries. Or your uh, bread and butter. That's what that's a keeps, bread and butter. keeps um, you busy. Yeah, those are, that's the majority of our surgery is going to be that. There's either valves, there's two valves on the right side, tricuspid and pulmonary valves. We do some operations on the tricuspid valves. So, Can you fix those too, or do you ever replace a tricuspid? We, yeah, replacing the tricuspid it, is a problem because it, it can clot off very easily because of low flow through the right side or, it's in, it's or in low deep pressure. In the, and that's yeah. deep in the middle of the heart. Isn't yeah, it? and it's all vein, venous flow. So it's not high pressure kind of washing the, the, the valve through. Ah. So we tend to try to repair those also. We can repair those. Yeah. Yeah, it for the most part, they can be repaired, except for uh, unless they're chewed away by endocarditis, which is infection of the valves of the heart. So. Do you see much endocarditis anymore? We do, you know what? Um, with uh, meth users and that type of thing, we do see them. It's amazing. You would think that people don't inject dirty needles, but they do. They do. So when you inject a bacteria, a dirty substance into your vein, it can go to your heart yes. and damage your heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's an awful thing. Yeah. Now, I know there are specialists that do pediatric, they work on small baby hearts. I know there's specialists that deal with what are called congenital anomalies. The, a person can be born with an abnormally shaped or routed or flipped, inverted heart. Do you ever do much any of those surgeries? No, we don't do any, not at my hospital, we don't do any pediatric heart surgeries. Now, how about if someone is born with an abnormal heart, like one of these tetralogies of fallow or switched uh, sides or inversus or this guy? Kind of is that something you do or is that something that should be done at a special center that does... A lot of them. Yeah. So the pediatric cardiac surgery really sh is so complicated and they're so infrequent that they sh need to be done. They're relegated to the specialized centers. Where they get to do enough of them and, and get to train on exactly. those very special cases. Yeah. And that's definitely something you want to look into when you're, especially uh, a lot of the diagnosis is done in utero while you're still during pregnancy. And we're going to talk about that with yeah. Dr. Mark Grant. So it's amazing. You can do a sonogram of an early pregnancy. Yeah. And the sonogram look at the heart. is so accurate. You can look at the heart. And then uh, they schedule these. And, that, and that's the time to look for where you're going to have your pediatric cardiac surgery done and start so your researching. So you deliver the baby. There. At there. Yes. And then they can be whisked off and addressed. By the pediatric uh, cardio threat. Yeah, cardiac absolutely. Surgery. That's a way to do it. The last thing that you want to do is deliver and have the diagnosis made uh, at that moment in extremis and then have to be shipped somewhere. In a helicopter and, right. if, and see what you can do. Amazing. Amazing work you do, Joss. So that leads me to, <clears throat> I think this goes back to your, your engineering. Did you say you were a mechanical engineer undergrad? Uh, chemical. 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 You were chem engine. Yeah, chemi. Yeah. So I was a I was a chemistry major. We used to call you chem engines and, and oh, all sure. that kind of stuff. So clearly, you've had a, uh, engineering in your blood and and how, how your mind thinks. And um, recently, I've become aware of a project that you've started that falls under the category of engineering and cardiac surgery and vascular surgery and i'm gonna i'm gonna set this up for you here when we train we have graded responsibility as a medical student you hold the retract then as an intern you you're starting to do some selling and then as you go through the ranks you get to start doing the cutting and and you're observed and you, you have more and more, more levels of responsibility as you train and you still have to start on a, on a person. I mean, you did, I'm sure there was some person who was the first person I cut with a scalpel, right? Yeah. right? And in order to train in procedures that are like, like these aneurysms and stuff where somebody's bleeding or a trauma, 
How do you get the training to do that, right? Well, you could train on a cadaver, right? But a cadaver is dead. Their heart isn't beating. Their blood isn't flowing. So obviously there's a need to train surgeons in a situation where bleeding is more realistic, right? So that you're cutting something, it has to, it's going to bleed and it's going to be a much more uh, valuable experience. So obviously this has been a problem for a while. When, when did it occur to you, Joss, that there was a need for cadavers that were more lifelike that actually bled when you cut them? This is an ongoing problem that people don't talk about. It's the training of surgeons, or not just surgeons, anybody that's providing care, surgical care, you know, whether sure. it be... Uh, um, a medic in the field or trauma casualty special ops or whatever. Um, how do you train them? And uh, I came up, I was uh, in my training, uh, something happened to vascular surgery, and that is the introduction of stents and to fix aneurysms, uh, which is great. Uh, and that's called endovascular endo being inside the vasculature okay and so the abdominal aortic aneurysms used to be done like you were talking about you open up the belly you stop the bleeding replace it it's a it's a bloodbath it's, it's a bloodbath it's a huge bloody mess uh well now we just run re we reline the aorta with tubes from the inside, just like Taver with her aortic valve, you know, set it up, put a new tube, new new inner tube in there. You fix the problem. So what happens is you go from 100% open, uh, a trainee getting uh, someone like me getting uh, over 100 aortic exposures to now a trainee done with vascular surgery. The average trainee is getting under five open cases in their training versus a hundred in your day. Right. Wow. So now you're asking this person to perform open heart, open aortic surgery. Cause you still need it. It's not like it's gone. It's not like there's cases where you can't still, fix it endovascularly. Yeah, yeah. There's still cases. Um, and they have no training. So it, when, when that started that revolution, it was like, well, how do you learn these, it, because the model uh, is you just keep, stay awake, stay up with your attending, you know, get make them, them happy, take some workload off them, you know, round for them, give put out orders. And if they like you, they're going to train you more. Um, and you just keep getting exposed. Like you're saying, you're always there. Uh, you're going to get more cases. Has completely changed. Now it's maximum 80 hours a week. Uh People have to go home. They have family life. They're not, the number of cases aren't there. Uh, there's other issues. You know, people are expecting better outcomes. So they, they don't want trainees working on them. Um, and, and how are they going to learn? How do you learn? How do you learn? Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I tell people, I, learning surgery, the hardest part of learning surgery is getting to do it. You don't, it's like saying, uh, you, hey, you want to learn the violin? Sure. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, you can't touch the violin. Uh, you, you can't practice. Book, right? You can read about it. You can watch videos. <laughs> yeah, YouTube it. All right. But the only time you're going to play the violin is during an actual concert. How well would that? That wouldn't go well. That wouldn't go well. But that surgery, that's what we do. Yeah. Right? You're not allowed to practice it. Um, so yeah, there's surgeries I do that the new trainees have zero experience on. There, no the exposure. Micro, the microsurgeries I do, there's no very little training going on nowadays. So how do you how do you learn that? That's it's how? crazy. That, so it, that, there's, what happens is there's these special centers. There's there's only a handful of places that still do it. Yeah. So you've got this problem in surgery, Joss, where there's getting less less and less hands on, less and less time. You know, pilots are rated by the hours, right? Right. Yeah, yeah we right. don't have that. Yeah, right? we don't have that. Right. So, so you, when did it occur to you that there was this need for realistic surgical training models or, 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 or I don't even know what you'd call them. Well, um, it's a, it's a model, uh, you know, pilots have uh, flight simulators that they, right? they can put in hours okay. and, it, and it's extremely similar, but 
in medicine and surgery, we don't have a flight simulator. So if you look at the industry, it's that's a billion dollar simulation industry, but it it's diverse in that there is no one simulator. And the reason is there's not a good simulator. So you mean in medicine, it's a billion dollar industry. Oh, yeah, medicine, yeah. So when did it occur to you, Joss, that you could make a better mass trap, that you that you could contribute to this field? So it was uh, it. I was influenced by my mentor in Tennessee, Dr. Ed Garrett, who I just happened to be talking to. And he said, you know what? I have a patent on uh, putting fluid into a cadaver to trial devices on. And I was like, well, really? Let me read this patent. And I just read it. And I was like, well, this is fascinating. Why don't we use this all the time? I don't understand. This is a right. great model. And that's when kind of the light click that this is something that could really get us to where we need it, it, it you know if you look at the history of of anatomy and you know back in galen you're talking about uh 800s all that they were they would study animals and they would do animal experimentation and extrapolate what a human anatomy was and they get all these things wrong and then it wasn't until Da Vinci and all those guys started doing yeah. human anatomy that we actually learned something. So I was like, this is like back to the future. We just like stop doing animal because there, there are animal, you know, people practice on animals, but it's sure, not in medical same. school. We practice on dogs and pigs and yeah. living. Yeah. So there's ethical reasons and anatomic reasons not to do that. So the other camp said animals do live animals. That's how, that's the answer. So, and I'm, and I said, in my mind, no, let's reanimate human cadavers and go that way. You get true anatomy. It's a lot more closer. So you recognize an unmet need. Right. It, that's it, the key it's against to the grain, success. Though. Everybody at that time said animals or computer simulations, like virtual reality. Uh, that that's the only two answers and I, no there's a third you answer. said there's a third way yeah reanimated humans oh my goodness this sounds like frankenstein i love it <laughs> it's I a little it. i mean so, it's a little so, like so, so your mentor or your, your colleague here had this patent yes but and but it wasn't enough it wasn't complete it doesn't work and so ah, so when there's you, an unmet need Right. So you put water or saline or whatever, pick whatever fluid you want into a dead person. Uh, it doesn't work. They bloat. It's like a. It seeps. You see, it, seeps. it seeps into the body. Yes. And doesn't provide a realistic blood flow. Right. So it was. Uh, um, so capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, right? And that's where the oxygen gets transferred to the tissue. And. Until I started looking into this, I thought capillaries were waterproof. You know, of course, blood, uh, or blood proof. They don't seep out, right? Uh, why, why would they seep out? That doesn't make sense. Well, they, they have to seep out because that's how you get exchange. And they have to be, tissue. the cells have to be alive uh, to maintain the fluid because they have, between them, they have junctions that are maintained by enzymes and proteins. It that has to be alive. That has to be alive. As so soon once as it you're dies, dead... That you lose that, and these capillaries become leaky. Leaky. So salt water will not. You can't pump salt water through a body. No. Add some food coloring and call it a, a realistic uh, model or blood, for that matter. So we, I used to get blood, human blood that was expired from the Red Cross, and pump it into cadavers, assuming oh, it's if I pump blood, it won't leak. Oh, it leaked like crazy. So all of that has to stay in the capillaries but when you're dead so when you get take a hit to your whatever and you get swelling well that's a natural default state of capillaries from damage oh. it's not your body's actively making no that's how they become it's, when it's they become a bruise dead. and a yeah. damage swelling okay so this is an unbelievable so you cannot pump water through a cadaver it as fast as you pump it in it just swell it won't it won't circulate. You so can't, you can't have pressure. do any any lengthy surgery, any realistic no. surgical scenario just, by pumping a red watery fluid through the body. Nor can you pump regular expired blood. No, it won't work. Yeah. So, Joss, what what light bulb went off in your mind 
to think, hey, maybe I can solve this problem. So I, I, I you know, it was a nagging problem. I, I, I was in Iowa when I started working on this, and then I was pumping blood through cadavers, and we would take them through the back, you know, the bowels of the hospital and take them to the operating room and experiment. And it, and then I moved here to Columbia, Missouri, and, I, and it, it was a nagging. It's like this problem that kept nagging me. It would not go away. And I said, you know what, I'm just going like, to spend a little time on this and just to see, can I figure it out? And I, you know, I'm reading and looking at electron microscopy of capillaries and reading more about the physiology of capillaries and, that type, and their makeup. And then I came up with some formulations and I took some hearts from the, the farmer's market, some cow, cow pig, hearts, cow hearts okay. and some pigs. And, you know, they sell it. People eat that. Did you know sure, that? Oh, yeah, very nutritious. Have you oh, had that? Uh, I've had deer heart, in fact. Uh, my my uh, embryologist That's... hunts, and it's very nutritious. And you eat that? Oh, sure. Man. Yeah. Well, you got to smoke it, and there's ways to make it, make it nice. Palatable. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so I would take it, and I would measure, just because I was in, I, more familiar with anatomy, and I would measure the fluid and, and finally came up with formulations. And, and I was like, okay, I think I found a pathway that would fix. So wait, 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 wait a minute. So you would pump into the coronary arteries of these hearts? With syringes, yeah. So, okay. So you had to, now did you do this in your basement or your garage? The garage, in the garage. In the garage. Oh, I love yeah. it. It's yeah. like Apple computer in the garage. Yeah. yeah I didn't you and Wozniak. One. Yeah, yeah. I but it was just you. Just me, yeah. So you had an idea. Now, I don't want to know the trade secrets, but you had an idea. Yeah, it's all patented, but there are trade secrets. So yeah, yeah. Well, you, sometimes you don't want a patent because then you got you got to right. put down what you got. So in addition, there's yeah, it's like Coca Cola. There's no patent on Coca Cola. Right. Yeah, because you don't want people to know what it, what's really in there. So, in your garage, you came up with a formula of a fluid that you could pump into a cadaver, into a dead human being, and it would circulate through the body. Well, it, you know, initially it was just hearts. So it would come out without swelling the heart or losing volume. So there was your proof of concept. Proof of concept. So I needed more. I needed a body, right? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so Frankenstein. <laughs> you waited with Igor and the shovels. <laughs> yeah, I could have used an Igor for sure. So I went to the Humane Society and they put dogs down like these Oh yeah, Pit fresh bulls. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, just with medicine, so they're not injured. Right. They yeah. euthanized usually with uh, penal barbital or something like that. Sure. Um, and they, uh, so I asked them, I was like, "Hey, what do you do with these dogs that you put down? And they're unclaimed, and oh, we throw them back in a freezer." And I was like, "Do you mind?" Can I cut in, please? Can I have your dance? <laughs> and they're like, "No, can go. I dance with you a date." <laughs> Go right away. Go right ahead. And uh, so I went back in their freezer, and you know, you don't want a Chihuahua because those are too small to operate on. But there's some right. pit bulls or Great Dane, you know, some bigger dogs. And I would throw them. They're frozen hard, uh, and I'd throw them in a. That didn't the damage the vessels. You could still free. You, you can freeze them. them. It does degrade the quality of the simulation. You you want uh, that? We learned later. But okay. But at this time, the problem was they put these dogs down kind of randomly, and it was hard for me. The timing was off. You get a fresh, right. a fresh carcass. Yeah. Now I, I naturally would love a fresh carcass, and it, you know, the first of the, the first um, experimentations with reanimation. Uh, you know the most famous one. You have the kites and the the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, lightning. Interesting, right? So galvanism. Gal, love it. Uh, Galvi was. Uh, yeah. You know, there's two. There's a there in uh, like this is late seventeen eight. eight it's like seventeen nineties, seventeen eighties. There are two uh, school songs. There's Volta, Volta, who who said you can make electricity from chemistry, and okay. he in, he invented the first cell, and then. Hence, we have volts. Right? Okay. And then there's Galvi, an Italian guy, who said, no, bodies have their own electricity, this mysterious electricity. And he was making, he would make a frog leg twitch uh, by touching, you know, the brass on the frog. And Volta is like, well, no, you're creating a battery and creating electrostatic electricity. Well, anyways, uh, um, Galvi died before his 
he finally uh it all came true to like what what exactly the cause of the problem was but his nephew kept going with the experimentation so like in early 1800s really early the first decade he arranged for a 20 something year old uh murderer uh, some guy who had drowned his wife to be hung to death and then immediately taken to the operating theater huh. and he applied electricity and made the eyes open and and made things twitch and trying to prove that there is some electricity that functions to him in your body anyway so the, based on those experiments yeah my ideal situation was you euthanize the dog i immediately take the dog while it's still warm and take him to but from a logistics point of view it was just impossible so i yeah. i went away i never got galvani's nephew's ah. opportunity to take a, a immediate death fresh yeah, 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 fresh yeah. death so so uh we thought i followed it and operated on it and then so it was a whole body now it's a totally different situation because you're looking at the bowels one of the the intestines tend to swell the most of any part of the body okay. and so that was my big concern is okay maybe the heart doesn't swell because it's muscle but the bowels will swell for sure okay and so i pumped it and it didn't swell oh, so i pumped it for like four hours uh -huh. in my garage. It didn't eureka yeah, that's your like, eureka it moment yeah it works so then we uh, uh started looking into pumps and i you know it was like well i need a good pump to simulate the heart so we started making our own pumps um and then the tubing system how do you do that and there's some patents with that and so it, it became more complicated but uh, we eventually got to the point where we went to a human and performed that human not in my house but <laughs> in a bio skills lab so 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 now it's starting to get real it started to get real yeah so now we were trying to scale it and uh one of the the lowest hanging fruit for me was the military because they go through it it's hard to say but maybe thirty thousand pigs and goats and animals to train, train their surgeons train their surgeons or even uh operators that are in the field the and medics and whatnot medics wow. yeah so the a huge need huge need and so the number one survivable so survivable injury if you get shot in the head you're not going to survive right right or if you get a blast to the chest you're not likely to so we're talking survival things are extremity injuries or junk you know growing injuries where it's hard to put a tourniquet on right right so those are the survival injuries well they're practicing survivable injuries on animals so is it, does that that made no sense the anatomy's to, not right it's not right it's like okay you're what it, like, you're way off your artery's not going to yeah. be there there's like emperor's new clothes i was like yeah. okay i get what you're practicing but you got way off anatomy it's like that makes no sense right but there's a tradition of that of using animals so we introduced uh, the human cadaver and we would put it out some of our first experiments were out in the desert and we would just hook them up to a a pump on a battery and they would go rescue it in the helicopter or the para, para jumpers pjs which are the air force special ops guys and bring it back and operate and all that and so we got a lot of experience pumping whole cadavers that way wow so you've actually been working with the military now did you have to enter a competition with some other are some other people trying to do this some other entrepreneurs so there is there were a couple of people um so the german military had a competition to you know worldwide how we, how do we get we want the best model for perfusion and so we okay. went to berlin and we participated you, you and who do you have some uh, some business partners we have business partners and technicians that work with me so yeah unfortunately you know with my schedule it's hard for me to go all these labs so i have sure. all these wonderful technicians that learn the techniques and are able to apply it without me being there um and they teach me too because they the more they do they go oh little trips and tricks and things like that so we went to berlin and uh Bundeswehr is the german army there and they commissioned this study 
thinking that, you know, hey, perf- they're pretty progressive there. They're perfuse cadaver. And, and they're part of NATO. Yeah, so German they, engineering is famous. Oh, so yeah. they oh. thought they had a, a good solution. Yeah, so we had some French come and there are people, Israelis, they're, you know, all over the world. They come. Top and, talent from around the world. Yeah, and we so we were clueless. I gave a presentation. There was a actual general there, like a two-star general she, uh, from their military there. And I, we all gave, I presented our, our data, and I got laughed at. I was like, no, that's, ah. that's a joke. You know, this and I was like, why are they laughing? Is there some kind of interpretation problem? Or I don't, like, I was completely clueless. Because it was so good, you mean? Yeah, it just didn't make sense to them. It's like, no, you cannot stop swelling in the dead body. Uh, it's not possible. Uh, they haven't been to Joss's garage. They hadn't, yeah, they hadn't seen it. So we, we did uh, the trial. It was a round robin. Nobody was allowed to go to anybody else's sh- uh, show. It was all closed. And then they had groups of people. And the first group came in. They're like, oh, this is wonderful. Next group came in. It was like, wait a minute. This is, there's something not right here. This is not the same as that. And they're like, this is the, the competition's over before it even started. And I was like, well, what are the guys doing? And they wouldn't let us see what I was in the dark. I was like, I don't understand what they're doing. Right. But, you know, and it, finally at the end of the competition, I was like, I talked to the other competitors and they were stuck on water and fluid and they had all these crazy concoctions they hadn't figured out the swelling yet so that changed everything and we were able to generate we can generate pressures and so let's fin- fin- finish the thing so you left that competition the winner yeah it hands was, down there was no company you it you no, won you yeah. solved the problem you you kicked everyone's butt yeah from yeah. around the world the other guys were worried about the pump and other issues they hadn't addressed the main issue so. and you've addressed the main issue the, yeah so now you are on the cusp of or not on the cusp but in the process of developing this technology so that medical professionals can train on truly bleeding what was the term you used could, could have a re, not reanimated on re, revitalized what was the word you used uh, reconstituted reconstituted yeah. so you can reconstitute a human cadaver so that you can do surgery on it practice life saving procedures what, what, whatever yeah. and get a true learning experience that has that is translatable directly applicable to patients right and and medical device development so that a lot of what we do is ah, it's a model for for yeah. other other device development. Okay, yeah, so I engineers it. use our model. They never get a chance to ever apply their uh, techniques on humans, right? They're it's engineers. all pig. Yeah, you can't. They're, right, right. They only use pigs. Yeah. So we example. we put this in the hand of engineers, and they learn all kinds of stuff. They're like, oh my god, I didn't know it was that hard to do that, or what is you know simple things. They're like, wow, this. This is an eye opener. So but the patient's dead. The so patient's, you're not hurting it. So you're just learning. Right. You're just oh, learning. Fantastic. Yeah. There's no limitation on who gets their hands on it. So where our hope is to uh, train physicians, you know, that's the most important goal. Um, speed up medical device development. So we right. reduce the time, you know, an, an average little, just a simple little device is a 60 million dollars just to get them sure. easy i mean at the low end right and right, like, right 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 and and about 20 million of that is done bench top and then 40 million for human studies well we can we think we can reduce that we can drop it by two-thirds uh to oh. to speed up development it's and we have examples of that where right, right. we were first in human not live human but first in human mm. and and then you can confidently go to hum- a live human because you've been through all those iterations versus a plastic model or anatomy that doesn't look anything like that. And then our third goal is to reduce um, or eliminate as much as possible animal live animal use. That'll make a lot of people happy too. Yeah. So it's a win-win-win situation, Joss. Now, I believe the name of your company is Maximum Fidelity Surgical Simulators. Yes. Fantastic. Well, we'll have a link to that uh, 
uh, on the podcast on, uh, well, on the, under the description label and, and below. And, uh, hopefully anybody watching this video will, uh, be able to contact you, uh, via that route. Um, well, that's really, really exciting, Josh. So I just want to say that it's just amazing how you're training in engineering, medicine, surgery, vascular, cardiothoracic has come together to make you both a, a complete cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic vascular surgeon and an entrepreneur uh, developing, uh, you know, just, just revolutionary technology to advance medicine. So, uh, Joss, I want to say it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It was great. What a pleasure. Thanks for doing Josh. this. These are great shows. So, My pleasure, Joss. Once again, thank you so much. Wish you all the best. Thank you.